from Nashville, Tennessee, we invite you to join us for the Amazing Grace Bible Class from the Madison Church of Christ. If I were to ask you this morning, where is God, what would you say? Some of you would respond, well, he's in heaven. Others would say, well, he's in my heart. Probably not many in this room, but there'd be folks out in the world who'd say, well, he's in some building somewhere. Well, the Bible says God's all over the place. Psalm 139, read with me verses 7 through 10. David said, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me, your right hand will hold me fast. Isn't it a mind-boggling thing to consider that God never needs to go anywhere because he's already there? God said through Jeremiah in chapter 23, Am I only a God nearby, declares the Lord, and not a God far away? Can anyone hide in secret places so that I cannot see him, declares the Lord? Do I not fill heaven and earth, declares the Lord? Folks, there is no place where God's presence is not. What we're talking about today is something theologians call the omnipresence of God. It literally means he's all present. He's here, he's there, he's everywhere. He's not limited by place or space. He is not confined by location, time, or any dimension. Now that's hard for us finite creatures to imagine because we are limited by those things, aren't we? Have you learned that it is impossible for you to be two places at one time? A lot of us have tried, but we're beginning to learn we just can't do that. But it's not a problem with God. Now, don't misunderstand. That doesn't mean that God is everything. That's a doctrine called pantheism. And it might amaze you how many people buy into that erroneous belief. They look around and say, God is the sky. God is the mountains. God is the grass. That's not God. That's his creation. Let's not confuse the creation with the creator. God is not everything but our God is everywhere. And that reality is made pertinent to us as clearly in Scripture as anywhere else in a speech Paul made in Acts 17. And in verse 28, he said, Listen, for in him, God, we live and we move and we have our being. 
Folks, that's simply saying you couldn't move apart from God. You wouldn't be alive. You couldn't exist without Jehovah God. He's holding it all together. He is the cohesive force in this whole universe. And so the fact is, God is everywhere. He's all around me. He's always beside me. One of my greatest needs in life is to just tune in to God and to understand the value of His presence. If I were giving you an analogy of what I'm trying to say, it's kind of like the television and radio waves that are filling this room right now. You and I know they're all around us. But at the moment, they are of no benefit to us unless we had the mechanism whereby we could tune in. Well, God's here too, kind of like those radio waves. And if you and I can learn to tune in to the presence of God, it will benefit your life limitlessly. Today in our lesson, on the back of your worship guide, the outline, I want to share with you four conditions, common conditions of life, where we need to sense God's presence and where we can receive immediate benefits. Look at the first one. When I am worried, God is my confidence. You know something about that, don't you? When I am worried, God is my confidence. Isaiah 43, verse 2 says, When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze, for I am the Lord your God. That last part where he says you can walk through the blaze and not be burned, what does that remind you of? If you know your Bible, surely it reminds you, of, like it did me, of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Remember? The captive Hebrew princes who wouldn't bow down to Nebuchadnezzar's image, and so he threw them into that fiery furnace. And when Nebuchadnezzar perched himself up to look down into the furnace, the Bible says he didn't see three figures, he saw four. And the fourth one, the Bible says, was like unto the Son of God. Some of you are going to go through the fire this week. I don't know what your fire will be. I don't know where your fire will blaze. It may be at work, it may be at home, it may be in the hospital. There is one thing, though, that I'm absolutely sure of. God will be going through it with you. When I'm worried, God is my confidence. The assurance of the omnipresence of God was the one thing that Moses needed at the burning bush. You remember? God wanted him to go back to Egypt. He wanted him to go back to that land where he had failed, where he was a fugitive. He wanted Moses to face the Pharaoh whose place Moses may have taken had he grown up in, in the Pharaoh's court. And Moses was full of excuses about why he didn't want to go. And each time, God basically told him the same thing. He said, Moses, I am with you. I'm your source of confidence. I love what David said in Psalm 16, verse 8. He said, I have set the Lord always before me. Now, you think about that for a moment. David didn't mean that he had the power to take God and put him before him. God's already there. There is no place God isn't. He's omnipresent. You know what David's saying? He said, I have set the Lord always before me. He says, I'm tuning in. I'm understanding that God's presence is always right in front of me. And then he concludes that verse by saying, because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. In each of these four conditions on your outline, I'm giving you a very specific benefit so that you won't walk out of here misunderstanding, no question. When you're worried, God is your companion. You know what the benefit for that is? God's presence calms me down. His presence calms me down. That's exactly the confidence that Paul had when he said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It is a confidence that will even let you stare death in the face. All of us know by heart the beautiful 23rd Psalm that begins, The Lord is my shepherd. You remember verse 4 of that, that Psalm? Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? What's the next phrase? For thou art with me. Oh, I've been inspired. I've, I'll tell you, the best sermons I've ever seen <laughs> and the best sermons I've ever heard were sermons at the hospital when I've stood beside the terminally ill patient who was a Christian, and I was there thinking I was ministering to them while they ministered to me, 
and they would look up with eyes of faith more times than I can count and say, Brother Steve, I'm going to die, and I know that. It's all right, for the Lord's with me. Folks, you can't get that from pop psychology. You can't get it from a positive mental attitude book. There's only one place you can stare death in the face and say, I will fear no evil. That's from knowing that God's with you. When I'm worried, he's my confidence. But look at the second condition. When I am lonely, God is my companion. Psalm 25, verse 16 says, Turn to me and be gracious to me, for I am lonely and afflicted. It's ironic, isn't it, that we live at a time when there have never been more people on the face of the earth, and yet we also live at a time when there have never been more lonely people on the face of the earth. Loneliness comes in all kinds of forms, doesn't it? There's the loneliness from the death of a spouse, the loneliness of the death of a friend. Some of you know the loneliness of divorce. There's the loneliness of a business trip, the loneliness of going to a new school. There's the loneliness of growing old or feeling like nobody understands you. There's even the loneliness of success. You've heard it said, it's lonely at the top. It really is. When you are the CEO or the top dog where you work, it's lonely there. Loneliness is universal, and the fact is, you are going to be lonely. Remember the loneliest time in my life. I'd been traveling for almost two weeks away from my family, and I was in an airport, and the flight had been canceled, and I had to wait another four hours before the next one could get me home, the last leg of the journey. And I sat in that airport, and there were thousands of people teeming past. And I've never been more lonely in my whole life. What do you do when you feel lonely? You just go find company, somebody to talk to? Maybe, but I've already said that sometimes you're loneliest in the crowd. I've got a little card that I keep in my top desk drawer. It simply quotes Hebrews 13, 5. It says, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. There was a song out a few years ago. It was pretty popular. It said, you'll never walk alone. And folks, that's true because God is always with you. The fact of the matter is, you and I don't like to face a challenge alone. Can you think back to your first day at school? I know I was glad Mama went with me. How about you? I don't like going into a tough battle, into a challenge. God never asks you to do anything by yourself. He's there. And when you realize that, you say like David did in that psalm, your presence fills me with joy. So what's the benefit then? What's the benefit of God's omnipresence? We said a moment ago, when I'm worried, His presence calms me down. But when I'm lonely, His presence cheers me up. Now that leads to the third condition. When I am tempted, God is my counselor. He's there with needed advice. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 is one of the richest verses in all Scripture. Listen to it. No temptation has seized you except what is common to man, and God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear, but when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. Boy, that's an encouraging verse. It's, it's filled with meaning, but look, let me point out a couple of things. First thing I see that I couldn't help but notice is that no temptation has seized you except what is common to man. That's worth remembering. Folks come into my office and say, Preacher, I want to share with you this unique problem I've got. <laughs> and I just want to, you know, I smile and say, Okay, but I'm sitting there thinking, Real? Yes. Frightening? Yes. Unique? No. No, there are no unique problems on the face of this earth. Scripture says we all share common problems. And you know what? That's great news. You know why? If we share common problems, that means there are common solutions. And if there are common solutions, surely they're found somewhere. Good news is they're found right here. No temptation has seized any of us except what's common to man. Now look at the second part. God is with me. That's what some of the newer speech translations say. It says, God is faithful. You know, I don't know about you, but the omnipresence of God is, is by itself, for me, a major route of escape from a temptation. When I realize that my God is right here beside me, His arm is around me, and as a Christian, He's even living in me, I, I mean, that, that gives temptation a whole new light, doesn't it? 
Paul gave a warning to Christians in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. He said, if you're thinking about going out and committing fornication and joining yourself sexually to a prostitute, he said, remember that Christ lives in you. You are a part of the body of Christ so that when you do that, you're linking Christ to a prostitute. I thought, boy, if every fellow who's ever committed fornication could keep that in the forefront of his mind, it would sure slow down the rate. And that's something. See the benefit when I'm tempted, God's presence helps me out. He knows the struggle I'm going through, and he's already preparing an escape route because his presence is there. Job knew that when he went through those tremendous temptations. And Job said in chapter 13, verse 27, you keep a close watch on all my paths. He is an eyewitness of everything we do. He's at the office. He's in the car going to work. He's at school. He's at home. He's in the bedroom. You know, there was a song out a few years ago called No One Knows What Goes On Behind Closed Doors. I'll tell you the truth. There is no such thing as a locked door to God. He cannot be kept out and he cannot be kept in. We started this sermon by reading from Psalm 139. We read through verse 10. Look at verses 11 and 12. You still have it open. It says, If I say, Surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you, for night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. Isn't it true that a lot of things are carried on in darkness that aren't carried on in the day? That's just, that's just the sinful nature within us. We'll go do something in the dark where we don't think anybody can see. You know what David said in the psalm? He said, Lord, I remember you created the darkness and the light. You've got night vision. You know, folks, this is worth remembering when we're tempted. Isn't it easier to control yourself when you know somebody's watching? Isn't it a lot easier not to cheat on a test when the teacher is standing about four feet from you looking down at your hand and your paper? Uh, teenagers, let me just pose a wild assumption. I, I got a feeling that for some of you, you're not quite as affectionate with your date in front of your parents as when you're alone. Is that a wild assumption? Or parents, have you ever been somewhere like at church or in a, in a restaurant and one of your children begins to misbehave and they're holding you hostage in front of them and you're kind of smiling and you're sitting there thinking, when we get home, we're, we're going to have a little talk about this, you know. And sure enough, when you get them where nobody's watching, out comes the rod of discipline. You, know? you understand what I'm saying. When you're being watched, it makes a difference. God's always there. He's always watching and when I'm tempted, he is my counselor. And then the fourth common condition where we need to remember God's omnipresence. When I am discouraged, God is my comforter. When I am discouraged, God is my comforter. Psalm 34, 18, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted and save those, saves those who are crushed in spirit. If you're here today and you're discouraged, and some of you are, there are just too many people here, some of you had to drag yourself here today. I've got great news. God's right here with you. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted. Another popular book out some time ago, Where is God When It Hurts? The answer is He's right there with you. Some of you come in here today ready to give in, ready to give up, ready to throw in the towel. You're ready to chuck it. You're ready to chuck your, you know, your job, to chuck your marriage. Some of you are ready to chuck your relationship with the Lord, ready to chuck coming to church. God is right beside you, eager to take your hand and lead you through. Now, I know some of you hear that and you just kind of sigh and go, oh, yeah, I guess so. Just kind of one of those spiritual, intellectual truths. I'll, I'll file away somewhere and I'll never make pertinent. But there are others of you in this audience right now and you know exactly what I'm talking about because you've been there. And he has comforted you and given you the strength to keep on going. One thing that goes with my occupation as a preacher, I get to see reaction to crises, to death, to emergencies. And as I visit the hospitals and the scenes of, of emergencies, one of the things I've always wondered is, how do people without the Lord make it? I, re I really don't understand. And you know, the answer is they don't. They really don't. They have their scars, they, they don't heal as quickly, they don't heal as permanently, they bury things and they're never really resolved, and they just keep on plotting. 
Let me read to you Isaiah chapter 40, beginning at verse 29. The Bible says there about God, He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youth grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. I can think of a hundred times when I've been discouraged, when I've been defeated, when I just kind of felt like nobody knew and nobody cared. But you know what? That's when you need to recognize God's presence in your life. Because when I'm discouraged, he's my comforter. So what's the benefit? We said first, God not only calms me down when I'm worried. Second, he cheers me up when I'm lonely. Third, he helps me out when I'm tempted. And fourth, he sees me through when I'm discouraged. You see, folks, the doctrine of the omnipresence of God is more than just an intellectual brain stretcher. He literally is the one through whom we live and move and have our being. Now as we close, look quickly on your outline. I want to share with you four ways to help you do what David... You know, David said in Psalm 16, I have set the Lord ever before me. Do you want to do a better job of keeping His omnipresence right there before your eyes so that you can take benefit of all those conditions we've just covered? Well, I want to give you just four quick things. This is not comprehensive, but it'll help. The first thing you've got to do is become a Christian. Become a Christian. See, everything we've talked about up to this point is universal for every living human being. God is around you. God is by you. But listen to me. God wants to be in you. He wants to put His presence inside of you. And here's why. Because when you feel these pressures coming from the outside of worry and loneliness and discouragement, you need an equal pressure from the inside fighting against them to stave them off. Have you ever noticed how people who feel pressure, they fill themselves with something to try and equalize that pressure? They may fill themselves with food or with booze or with another kind of drug, but they put something on the inside to equalize the pressure on the outside. Well, the Bible said, here's what you put on the inside. You put the Holy Spirit of God on the inside. You see, the Bible says when you are baptized into Christ, you are given the gift of the Holy Spirit. Acts 2, 38, Romans 8, 8 through 11, 1 Corinthians 6, 19, and a dozen other scriptures I can give you. And that presence indwelling in you is what staves off the pressure from the outside. The Galatian letter says he bears his fruit of love, joy, peace, gentleness, faithfulness, nine wonderful fruits, self-control. And that's why Ephesians 5, 18 says, don't get drunk on wine, but instead be filled with the Spirit. First thing you need to do if you're going to really sense the omnipresence of God is become His child. Second, real simply, just be quiet. <laughs> be quiet. You know the reason so many people don't get the benefits of God's presence? Simply because they're too busy, too distracted. They got work to do, got the TV on, got the radio on. And David said in Psalm 46, 10, just be still and know that I am God. Pascal once said that most of man's problems come from his inability to sit still. <laughs> That's the truth. You and I would, would, if we could practice the presence of just being quiet and sensing God's presence every day, we'd live happier lives. And if you can develop the discipline to do that several times a day, your life will take on a depth and a serenity that you've never experienced. The third piece of counsel from God's Word is develop the habit of praise. Psalm 100 verse 4 says, Enter His gates with thanksgiving and His courts with praise. Now I've heard that verse used all my life to talk about us coming to our Sunday morning assembly like we're doing right now, but it's not limited to that. See, praise is a continual experience and nothing can help you tune in to God's presence more quickly than praise. And you can praise God in your car, you can praise God at lunch. You can praise God in the shower. That's some of my best place to praise God is in the shower. You say, how do you praise God in the shower? Well, I, I, I quote Scripture. I quote Psalm 19, verses 1 and 2. Or, or I'll sing just a praise song that we sing here when we gather. Why? It reminds me of God's presence. And then fourth, talk to God about everything. 
Just open up to him. This is what's behind 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, the command to pray without ceasing. That doesn't mean that you have to be in a closet 24 hours a day and on your knees, but just as you're, as you're making your way through life, maintain an ongoing conversation with God. David said in Psalm 62, 8, Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your hearts to him. Now you say to me, but preacher, I've done that. <laughs> and I'll tell you, when I pour out my heart to him, a lot of times I don't feel like my prayers ever get above the ceiling. I got great news for you today. God is below the ceiling. Isn't that great? See, sometimes we think we got to jack up some super prayer and launch it like a rocket, and it's got to be deep and full and make its way into God's right there. Even as you're forming the thoughts right here, he's taking them out of your mind. And he's reacting and responding to them right there. Folks, a whole new life opens up to you when you realize that God is always with you. That there is not a place you go where he's not by your side. Bow and pray with me as we close this lesson. Great God in heaven, as we bow in your presence, we say very openly that we adore you and we love you. And God, as we have reflected upon what you've shared in your word, we know you are here right now with us, not because we're in a building that is where we come together to worship you, but because, Father, you are everywhere. And Father, as we leave this place and as we go out into our work week tomorrow, help us be reminded that as we deal with coworkers, or while we're driving down the road, that you are right there with us. And Father, when we're worried and when we're lonely and when we're tempted and when we're discouraged, may we apply what you've clearly told us about the benefit of your presence. Father, as we pray to you now, we would pray that if there are any here, any listening over television, who have not obeyed the gospel and who do not have your presence living in them, that they'll do that so that, Father, they can really experience the written richness of your omnipresent nature. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for being there. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. If you would like a free transcript of today's lesson, write us at Amazing Grace, Post Office Box 419, Madison, Tennessee, 37116. Please mention the title and number of the lesson when you write. Amazing Grace is brought to you by Churches of Christ, Visit one in your community. Thanks for love.